Okay, everybody, I want to thank you very much for hanging in. I know it's been a long day, and this is the last uh, session of the day, um, but I'm hoping it's going to be well worth your while. Uh, I would first like to uh, thank the Friendship Center and others for the very warm welcome that we received uh, to this, the unceded ancestral home of the Mi'kmaq people. Uh, I know we've come from different places to be here. Uh, I'm from Ottawa, which is the on the unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people. Ottawa is the Algonquin word for to trade. Uh, so the good people of Ottawa decided back in 1863 to change the name from Bytown, which was named after the um, engineer, uh, British uh, military engineer who designed the Rideau Canal to protect us from an invasion of the Americans, by the Americans, to, um, to Ottawa in order to distance us from our, from the colony, from, from our colonial masters. And while I think it was a good start, I think we have a long way to go uh, to really uh, repair some of the harm that, um, uh, that has occurred since then. So we we'll look forward to that, and I think a very good place to start is to look after our, our homeless as best we can. So um, today's session is, or this, this session is looking at resurfacing an uneven path, solutions to transitions in care. I think this is a very interesting and important area, and it has to do with um, what our guest speaker this afternoon talked a little bit about, which is pre preventing people from flowing into homelessness. Um, so uh, there are many opportunities when people are leaving institutional care uh, and with no place to go, which makes it particularly challenging for them. So you're looking at, um, you know, uh, these transitions are difficult. So even people leave, leaving shelters and moving into permanent housing face some challenges. Certainly people uh, from hospitals to discharge uh, face some challenges. And, you know, my, I'm, I should have introduced myself. I'm Catherine Latimer, and I'm the my day job is the executive assistant, or executive director of the John Howard Society of Canada, which deals with the challenging transition of people leaving custody and coming back into communities, and, and far too many of our people leaving custody are being released into homelessness, which you know is is not good for anybody, particularly particularly them. So we need to find a way of of trying to make things better for the people who are leaving these um, circumstances. And so today we're we're having two presentations, and we'll hear about whole person interventions to address these complex needs of those experiencing homelessness as they go through transitions and how we empower people um, with meaningful activity and functional living and other things to give them the skills uh, to be able to, to handle this transition uh, better. So our first speaker, I'm going to introduce both the speakers now, uh, so bear with me, is Vanessa Sito. She's going to look at whole person care, uh, primarily around women's uh, post-sheltering experiences. She has a PhD, uh, she's a PhD student in rehabilitation sciences at McGill University, and she's worked as an occupational therapist uh, at a women's transitional home in Montreal uh, and was an occupational uh, therapy and post-shelter supports being provided. Um, our other presenter is uh, Jesse Jenkinson, uh, who's looking at a patient navigation for the homeless in an acute care hospital, which is uh, St. Mike's Hospital in Toronto. She's a senior research as associate at MAP, Center for Urban Health Solutions, and this is part of the St. Mike's Hospital Toronto focus on healthcare system improvements to support unhoused individuals both in the hospital and in the community. So I think these will be very interesting and uh, I turn the floor over to Vanessa. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Catherine. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, does everyone hear me? Am I close enough to the mic? It's good? All right, I have a tendency of kind of not really speaking loud enough, so. Um, so, hello, my name's Vanessa. Uh, you actually pronounced my last name right. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone gets it wrong. Um, and I'll be talking about a functional whole person care approach in homeless women's post-shelter transitions. Unfortunately, my co-presenter, Myrna Rose, couldn't be here today uh, due to you know, various reasons. Uh, but you'll definitely get to hear her perspective on it and hear her present as well in the upcoming presentation. 
Um, okay. So, ideally, by the end of today, you'll all be leaving with a, um, a knowledge of what the functional whole person care approach is. If you don't have any idea about what it is, then I've not done my job properly. Um, and knowing what its benefits are for women in their post-shelter transitions um, specifically. Uh, however, you know, it can be applied to various other populations as well. So definitely take this as another tool to use in your toolkit to be adapted according to your needs as well. Uh, so ideally as well, you'll be able to understand, well, why is this approach needed, right? Like what's the gap that it's trying to fill? And um, as well as, well, who provides it? You know, I'm an occupational therapist. I'm sure everyone here um, is, is uh, doesn't doubt that it's about occupational therapists. And while well, detailing the role of the occupational therapist in this community setting, uh, given that it's a very underused uh, profession in the community setting specifically, Jill, just by a show of hands, how many of you work with an occupational therapist directly in your community teams? Perfect, that's wonderful actually, all right. That's, that's, that's very good. You guys are light years ahead of Quebec. <laughs> so um, just to give a bit of background um, and a bit of context so that this presentation is understandable, my background really is in occupational therapy. I worked as a clinician, and that's the hat I'm going to be wearing for this presentation. So yes, the PhD is, uh, was initially presented. I'm currently on sabbatical. Um, and that's why it's presented. And uh, the clinical experience is what we're really going to be talking about today. Um, and furthermore, this is contextualized in Legifam. So Legifam, you, some of you may have heard it in previous conferences that were given. Um, but it is a transitional home for women and their children. And they offer several different services and different programs. And it is, once again, in the Montreal context, Montreal, Quebec context. So they offer the first program, which is really just a transitional home, a shelter where women can stay for up to one year. And they're followed up with intervention workers. Um, after that one year, they're asked to go. So they have to find another place to live, uh, either in autonomous living or um, and finding another program that they can go to. The services offered by Legifam also include a three-year transitional apartment. So after that one year, if women have the opportunity to, if the apartment is available, they can transition into these transitional apartments if they desire to. And lastly, the third service that is offered by Legifam is the post-shelter support program, which spans one and a half years after a woman has left either the shelter or the transitional home. So in this particular support program, uh, they can be followed up by either a case manager or the occupational therapist and or the occupational therapist um, in integrating their new environment to give them that support as they move to another living area or environment. So let's meet Myrna, my co-presenter. I will let her introduce herself, uh, but before going into that, she is a person that I worked with um, as an occupational therapist. With, so she has lived experience with homelessness and she went through all of the different programs as I described at La Gifam. So let's try to get this video working. My name is Myrna, and I am arrived in Canada at the age of 18 and work with a family who sponsored me. And I live on their farm for many, many years. And the system brought up, we can inherit the farm, but they sold it, the farm. And that made me to own this. I had to call a shelter and a farm, larger farm. But when I went to larger farm, it was very lonely for me because I did not have many friends. Neither do I have any body around to show me around. I was scared and I had a little knowledge of what the person and different say would be. I was the only black person in a large farm and I was not sociable in that. There was no family. I was only black and new faces. A different culture was in a large farm. So I had to work with myself and all to socialize with other people. 
neither do I have no identity how to start over. It was hard. The change in the address and all the changes of how my belonging or my life was will be changed. But after the year, you still have to go through another thing, the translation home. Living in the translation house, I got my own place, my own key, but it was scary because I did not live alone in my life. I always lived with family. And when I had to live on a home, it was very, very difficult because I was not sure if I could keep this apartment. I, was, I wasn't working and I was scared that I didn't have enough money to pay the rent because I've never paid the rent. I live with family. And one of the reasons to me was trying to fit into society when I had lost a lot of my identity. And it was all that thought of worry and scare came back to me. What if I can't make it? And it was hard even to get finance assistance. And it was difficult because it, the, rent, the rent were coming up and I did not know how to pay it. I have never used the, the phone to pay it in my life because I work on phone. So it was scary. How am I going to get my rent paid? The diabetes in my life was very difficult because you need people, I need the legal, and I also need to go to the pharmacy. I couldn't get, the inje I couldn't get my injection and I could not get, my blood sugar was always up and down and I could not get it under control because I was worried, I was had no money and it, it rare that I couldn't get my medication. I didn't know what to buy in grocery shopping and it was very hard and to even to adjust to the simple life and trying to get food where would keep my diabetes down. It was difficult. What the price was and how I have to go about trying to figure out how to what my next meal is and how to cook. At night, you heard, when I'm at home in the day, it didn't really scare because I could put on the radio and it would help. But at night, when you're alone, you get different thoughts. You're like, the door is trying to open and it was not it was just scary because I didn't adjust to be alone. Everything was scary and difficult outside because outside I'd never, I'd never have to, to do it on my own. And it was very difficult living in a strange neighborhood, never been outside the neighborhood. Even to take the metro was scary. Uh, I got lost many times. And it was difficult because the barrier of the language, I, didn't, I don't speak English no French and I could not explain myself where I want to go and like using the phone it was a little bit scary for me because it was I didn't show where to go with Google Map or anything and I have also the difficult sometimes trying to make the phone call and it was hard and to eat to have a job I was my address my identity I've changed when they're doing a job and doing part time they didn't want to pay me because it was, it's just, they just figure it's part time. And I was naive, you could just say, okay, you don't want to pay me. I was also in pain because of my back and my back. I was always in pain. And I had lifting up things and doing twice the things to uh, try to make myself fit in. And when I was in pain, the manager still tell me, I can, I must still work. And it was, no more much pain I was telling him I was in, he didn't quite believe me. You just still say, hey, you can work and you will, it will be okay. That three years still come and other changes because another changes, that firm was not going to renew my uh, my three years again. So what I have to do is find home. And being on that home, it's stressful, very stressful. The most scary part of it was, what is the change from me going from here? Could I finance myself? Would I be alone? Or would I not fit in, in the neighborhood? But I find myself, after, the change, after being through that, I realized what I had to do and how I can do it. And I learned to rely on what I've learned in the past, how to change my lifestyle. And I have many of who always helped me, so it was much easier than me when I come in to live on my own. All right. And so from Myrna's story, we start seeing different elements of what that post-shelter service gap really is. Um, 
the first component, and I think you know, you're all here and we've heard it several different times and in different ways throughout the presentations today and yesterday, is that women's needs are gender specific. Their trajectories into and out of homelessness are specific to them. And uh, they're often marked with more violence, more abuse, more entrenchment in gender roles, difficulties and inaccessibilities in our healthcare and service systems um, due to not meeting certain criteria, for example, um, having needs that are outside of what our services can provide. So given that it's entrenched in all of this trauma and all of these varying complex needs, um, I think we start seeing that several domains of a person's life can be affected by an event, by what the person has gone through and their entrance into homelessness. Uh, so for example, if you take someone who lived through domestic abuse, uh, that person might come out with physical health difficulties, mental health difficulties, you know, emotional health difficulties, social isolation, financial difficulties. You know, I think we're all at this conference, we all know how complex homelessness is. And, um, that leads to our second post-shelter gap in services in that our healthcare and social services systems are not uh, made for these overall approaches. So everything is, usually services are given in silo. So healthcare uh, professionals work in silo, one from another. And when they work on a problem, it really is problem-based. So it's problem condition specific, organ specific, and everyone kind of has their own specialty. So women end up bouncing from one professional to another. And there really isn't some overall overarching um, you know, care for them in our system. And so examples are, for example, tools given to a person to manage their substance abuse difficulties, or tools given to someone to manage their mental health symptoms, um, or diagnoses, et cetera, et cetera. And this really is a focus on, well, the what as opposed to the how to, right? We're giving people different things to manage certain problems, but we're not telling them, well, how do we integrate all of this with all of the other tools and the other activities that you do in your everyday life? And this, um, this has a really, a really big consequence on people. So these needs and problems actually have a cumulative effect on, on people. And these difficulties um, end up making it so that someone might have you know, a plethora of different tools and different strategies to use medication, uh, you know, pamphlets about, how, about sleep hygiene, um, strategies that they've learned from different healthcare professionals, and they might still have difficulty completing grocery shopping or managing a budget or doing all of those things together, because in order to manage your budget, you need a grocery shop in a certain way, or you, know, you need to do different things so that everything kind of comes together. So that is the gap, in that the tools given to women are inadequate to overcome these complex functional difficulties that are encountered by women in our current systems. Um, Myrna does say that women arrive into homelessness with their trust broken, so that's you know, that whole, um, that whole experience and that all that trauma that they kind of bring with them. And we have to consider that in the things that they do every day in their everyday lives. Um, not taking the time to really understand women's difficulties, experiences and feelings and how it can affect everything they do can lead to inter intervention that isn't right for them. So that's what Myrna wanted to add to that slide. And that leads us to the gap. So um, the gap, the solution. The gap leads us to the solution. The functional whole person care approach is a particular approach used by occupational therapists. And what it does is instead of starting from the bottom, from the problems that a person might encounter or might have or the traumas that they've lived, it starts from the top. So it starts from the activities themselves with a top-down approach. Um, and it's goal-focused. And what that does is that it asks a person, okay, what are your needs now, right? What are your needs now? How is your everyday living now? And uh, it, is, is, uh, it really focuses on meaningful activity and functional living. So not, I really wanna highlight that at the heart of meaningful activity is that word meaningful, right? Saying, well, what's important for a person? 
it's not necessarily what I'm going to tell them is important for them. It's what that person determines as important for them. So we'll identify these meaningful activities together and how and all these different activities that they need to do in their lives and that they want to do. So we call those occupations. And um, together, we'll identify the barriers for each of these activities. And this leads us to the whole person part of the functional whole person care approach. The, um, by identifying barriers that are whole person, right, that range over several different domains, just by listening to the story of the person and understanding what their needs are from that one activity, using that top-down approach, we're taking into account a whole, uh, a whole perspective, right? So all of these different things, a whole umbrella of problems that might be encountered in doing an activity. So um, there are points three and four here, uh, which is that you know there, those are other components to the functional whole person care approach in which changing identities does come with this approach and advocacy is often used using this approach as well. I'll switch it over to the next slide because I find it much more clear. Um, I'm not sure if you see it, but basically at the top you have activities, right? So in, the, in this pyramid, at the top you have activities, and then you have the identification of barriers with the person. And these barriers can come from several different contexts, right? It's not just the individual, as we all know, who might have problems it, um, or have difficulties in certain things. Uh, they, it might come from the environment, right? So thinking about someone who is handicapped, who doesn't have an accessible bathroom, for example, or someone who's at work and their manager is just putting a lot of pressure onto them, right? That's not a person thing, that's, a, that's an environment thing. And you might have that the activity itself is not adapted to the person's, you know, does not meet the person where they're at. So this whole process of identifying the meaningful activities, identifying meaningful um, barriers to these uh, activities, and then working on them is the functional evaluation. So um, occupational therapists will then work on these barriers either by helping a person, you know, teaching a person how to do it, um, adapting the activity itself, adapting the environment, adapting something if you know, teaching is not the solution to the problem, or through advocacy. And by working on these barriers and making it so that a person is succeeding in their everyday functioning, you know, being able to grocery shop and being able to meal prep and being able to, to pay for everything that they need to pay for and keep their jobs, um, that influences the perception of self. So saying, well, I'm confident now, like I can do these things, right? And that's where the identity component comes in because it changes people's identities. As they feel more confident, they're able to feel like they can engage in other new occupations, new identities, and explore new identities because they feel safe and they feel like they're able to do it, right? And that's why we have the identity changes from the top of the pyramid to the bottom, and there's the advocacy on the bottom. Using this functional evaluation approach, given that we're starting at the activity and then going down to the problem, well, me as an occupational therapist, I can take the evaluation and go see other healthcare providers and go refer uh, to other people saying, well, this person is actually like this person has a, like a, a difficulty, a functional difficulty, has a hard time grocery shopping due to X, Y, Z, because I've identified that with the person. Um, so in that case, we can go and talk to the doctor. Maybe I'll write a note for the doctor. We can go and talk to the pharmacist, see what's up with that. Maybe it's more of a, um, you know, like a communication barrier. So this functional evaluation approach can also be used in more of an advocacy way as well and systems navigation way as well. So... I do want to let Myrna speak now, and she'll tell you a little bit about what we did in occupational therapy um, and what were the different steps that were explored. We discuss it, and we tried, Vanessa and I, to walk the neighborhood and by our man first to feel that you feel safe. And once it started to feel safe, you're more focused on how you can love the neighborhood and know the neighborhood. And you see different faces, you see familiar faces, and you know you can walk around and use protection with your phone if it's if anything you get call. I learned to talk to people, I learned to uh, walk around the environment and see different, like going to the park, but with my opportunity she showed me that how to move, get involved in in the park, 
like getting involved with Tai Chi, trying to move with people, watching birds, simple things like even sit and watch a bird say, in the summer and the beautiful water, what the different culture come into the park and see. It's a, what, what I would like to do and what I could. And I challenged myself to speak to everybody. And it was difficult, it was very nice because I learned to communicate with other people and I knew new friends. And I also see old friends is from the Twitter path. And it was a fun thing to do with my friends because things are always there when I need her in the morning. She had a shopping, how to use the phone to start us. So you got all of these Google and everything else and you learn to, to practice how, how you can use a phone and how you can communicate with different things on your phone. And it was not, this phone didn't just look like it's scary. It was a piece of tool you learn like you're going back to school and you can learn it how to reach out and touch and make phone calls. I've learned, you know, taking, taking public transportation was a little bit easier because I get to speak, I get to communicate, and I get to look around to see what 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 direction the train the train is coming and what direction to come off the train. And it was very 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 nice to ease the to understand the train route that the four seasons at four corners. You can always if you get lost, you can always return back and go from where you start. It may take time, but you learn that. I also learned the route of the map, so it, when you got out, you have the map to show you where you're going. It very, was very much easier and helpful for you. We have, uh, in Upper Church, we will talk about how to learn how to di 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 manage my diabetes by doing exercise and walking and eating properly and maintaining my blood sugar. I'm not going up and down. And I've learned how to Adapt, adapt to the system of how how I can get around the system and it's very easy once you have somebody to show you around how to do it and how to understand your point of view. But to have diabetes it's a challenge itself because you have to learn how much medication you take and how many you need to take and you have to also learn you have to learn to know the food and, and read the label on the food. I will learn that we cook, I cook healthy, not going on to McDonald's like I used to do and buy McDonald's or any team. I learned that at home I can set, set myself a plate by cooking it and it's more healthy. And I learned to keep my diabetes under control by doing stuff where I can do exercise, how to do walking, how can I do, what I can do to keep that diabetes under control. It's under control and it's not up and down. Uh, Vincent have taught me how to walk with me to show me the different risk what to, I can buy and I make the choices of what is healthy. And I've cooked with Vincent. I think the first time I pick up something that was supposed to be healthy, it was tofu. <laughs> and I didn't take go. <laughs> I just did a little tofu. And up to now, I still don't like tofu. But <laughs> I eat a lot of more healthier food choices. <laughs> And the budget was very, very easy once you learn to, to do it. You have to learn to, to budget yourself and how much money you got to put on. And that's going to work and start to save and pay up the debts what I had to do and learn from there how to budget myself. First of all, the honest truth, I was, um, I was confused because the Austin system always writes me a letter and they write it in French. It was hard for me to even read French when you don't read it. And I had to sit with my friends and my upper kitchen therapist who can say, this is what the letter is coming in, in French. And we had my friends and I sit down and we call and we talk about it. And it correct itself that they could send it in English. When I started to work, I was very tired. She had told me how I can do, what exercise I can do and how can I do it and not get hurt. And I wasn't feeling tired, I take deep breaths. And I also learned I have the right to take two breaks and one lunch. I had to sit down with Monica and ask her, what is the rights in Canada? Because it was not the same rights we have back home. And I also have to learn that 
learning the right it's it's was one of the biggest things I've learned in life. I learned where where I can say no and hold the limits of what I can say to people or myself without worrying about getting hurt or getting fired. I did a lot to help people around me because most of the people, although they're born Canadian, they did not know the red leader because they just say, oh well, I'm not doing this. And I had to tell a lot of people that for some start, you have to the right to take two short breaks. And you have the right to have a long lunch. And you have the right to take time for yourself. Not just being because your boss told you to do this. And I learned how to protect myself and learned how to finance myself so it was not becoming like, you know, get a letter saying, hey, there's no money in the bank. There's always some money in the bank to cover your finance and the, ex the expression of what comes with it. So, we discuss it and we discuss all right. So I, I find Myrna really, really funny and really eloquent. I think she explained it really well. <laughs> so um, there are a few things that I really wanted to add to her presentation, actually. Um, and that notice that in terms of continuum of care, when we talk about post-shelter transitions, it's not really, it's not just at the end, right? It's not after a person has left. It, like the work and the capacity building and making a person feel safe and ready to, to live on their own really starts much earlier. So it started for her in the shelter. And she actually worked with occupational therapy students. Uh, so that's a collaboration that Legifem has with McGill University, um, where they broke down the tasks that she needed to do at the shelter, you know, being able to contribute to the home, do the chores, uh, living with others, community living, um, you know, finding self again. She I think she said it, she had lost her sense of identity, right? So um, they broke that down and then they created activities and interventions that were collaboration-based. So saying, okay, well, how do we grade collaboration given that she's never really done that before? Or how do we explore different facets of uh, their identity or people's identity so that way they can refine facets that they, they maybe lost on their way into homelessness or um, find new ones? And dealing with stress management as, you know, as this, um, as this is a very traumatic um, experience as well, the arrival into a shelter. And so I put everything that she said into a neat little table given, you know, my, <laughs> my background. Uh, so we have these three columns. We have the meaningful activity, the underlying barriers, and the interventions. I'm not gonna go over everything because she really did explain it, like I said, very well. Um, I did want to, highlight some things that I did with her, however. So we have, uh, for example, making, managing and making social connections outside of home that she identified as being important for her in her post-shelter transition. Um, and you know, it's a lot of things that some people might take for granted, right? If you're not doing this activity breakdown, you might say, well, everyone knows how to make friends. You know, everyone knows how to, what that process is, how to engage in small talk, but she really didn't know how. She lived on a farm coming from the farm in, a, in an illegal employment situation to the city in a homeless shelter in Montreal. Uh, she didn't know how to do that. She was never surrounded by anyone other than that family she lived with. So we worked on simulations. I would simulate being a passerby in the, in the, in the park and then she would talk to me. Uh, we did gradual exposure. Um, and in terms of navigating the city, so there was a fear, you know, in her discourse, there's a fear of strangers, fear of abandonment. And I really wanted to highlight uh, the trauma-informed care approach that is embedded in this practice. Um, because by using uh, meaningful activity, walking in parks, places where she felt safe and where she felt connected, I was able to make her feel, and we were able to, to collaborate together and make, um, make the situation easier for her, navigating the city and walking around the city. She said, well, like, city is actually a safe space. Um, so this is the subway system, metro system that uh, she talked about. Uh, really learned to read the maps with her. And we really went up there and we're like, okay, well, what station is what? Um, and here, is, here are pictures of the parks that we walked in. So she really, I was like, look at the birds and look at the trees and you know, how does that make you feel? And she's, you know, she talked through it. Um, and there's that Tai Chi group that she talked to, that she mentioned. She really just tapped on their shoulder and she was like, hey, can I join your group? <laughs> and that was part of the gradual exposure, right? I was like, Myrna, you can do it. Go and ask them questions, you know, go and join the group. Um, and that was developing that skill of how to, how to join things and you know, how to do that. And I didn't do it for her, she really did it herself. 
So uh, the rest of the table, uh, once again, wanted to highlight that in her diabetes management and her work, it really was a systems navigation, right? It was saying, okay, well, how do I navigate my rights? How do I navigate the environment around me? Um, and so we did task adaptations, you know, energy management. Uh, I really cooked and I cleaned and I grocery shopped with her uh, to make her feel comfortable with doing it and teaching her strategies and her coming up with strategies that worked for her. So, how does she feel about all of this? I'm sure you're all dying to know. Very much independent. On my own, I can do everything. And I have changes came, but I accept the changes, and I am independent to move forward to make life beautiful. I am happy. <laughs> I'm very happy. <laughs> my home is one of the precious things I have learned on my home to accept because it's what I have gone through the steps and it become my home. I am so proud of my own house. It's amazing to know that I, I really come this far. During this interview, we really and show, show me how far I have come to have the tools to have open up the doors because at one time I didn't think the doors was going to open. And, and I felt connected to the Canadian what, the lifestyle of living and I felt proud enough that I can apply, want to apply to get my Canadian citizenship. She says to say I'm a Canadian and I felt good that, you know, it was, I didn't feel like I'm a Jamaican background no more. I felt like I am Canadian. I have work hard enough to say I'm Canadian and it brought me feel proud. I would love to become a nurse. It's always my idea, my fall to become a nurse because it's stronger. It makes you more beautiful to, um, to acknowledge what people what people can do for you. And I want to be a part of the people. I'm trying to make my, the next move is to build my own surrounding to buy my own, own, own house, which is, that's a percentage of happiness. <laughs> I feel very useful when I'm in the city of around the city. It's safe. And you get you get to learn different these different things. You get to see different people, different culture, different how to act react to Canadian lifestyle. I can go to the stores and I have no no problem going to the store and pick up what I want. Alright. So so I have to wrap it up because uh, I'm taking too long, I ramble. So uh, benefits include, uh, well, Myrna really described them. So occupational therapists can identify difficulties that other workers cannot see to help a person get better faster to then training the skills and tools for every day, which makes a person feel more understood. Um, if she would not have shown me uh, how to do it, then uh, she wouldn't have learned the skills, is <laughs> the summary of the quote. Um, and the key takeaways, so basically this uh, functional evaluation, identification of meaningful activity uh, leads to the identification of meaningful barriers to function that are not apparent in our current system. So Myrna wouldn't have been flagged in any system. She has no diagnosis, no mental health difficulties. Um, you know, her diabetes had a once a month follow-up, I think, or once every few months follow-up. Um, and it teaches a person the everyday activity skills and uses advocacy approaches by using the functional evaluation approach. And the benefits are the empowerment and the growth of identities that um, people I work with uh, experience. <laughs> so special thanks to Myrna and to my supervisor, Laurence Roy, and the team at La Gifa. And there's my email. I'm about to make a run for it, but I'm just freezing. So I'm going to put my coat on. It is so cold in here. I guess it keeps us awake, right? Uh, oh. <laughs> oh, that's okay. That's my job then. All right. Uh, do you want to save your changes for your PowerPoint? Uh, no. All right. Um, there we go. Thank we you. For we will that. have time for some well. questions at the end if you, if you have any questions for Vanessa. Hold on. <coughs>
Hi, everyone. Thank you again so much for staying. Um, last presentation of the day. Really appreciate your time and for being here. I hope you can see my face above the screen. Um, I just want to recognize, so I'm Jesse. I come from MAP Center for Urban Health Solutions. MAP is not an acronym, so it doesn't stand for anything. Um, it's based at St. Michael's Hospital, which is part of Unity Health Toronto. And so we're right in the downtown core of Toronto. Um, I just want to recognize the research team. Um, uh, Olu, Dada, Kate, Franco Pridham, Jeremy Sigler, and Stephen Huang, um, who is the lead behind the project and the program. Um, Olu, in particular, has done a ton of work around uh, data collection analysis, so I just want to give him a shout out. Um, I also want to acknowledge the study participants, the research team again, um, hospital workers who are supporting uh, the program in their day-to-day -day work. Um, and the survey research unit at Unity Health Toronto, which has done a, an enormous amount of work um, doing data collection for a randomized control trial that I'll briefly mention, um, and the process evaluation and the funders. So by the end of this presentation, what I really aim to do is explain a hospital-based intervention that supports people who are unhoused, experiencing homelessness, um, how we implemented it, lessons learned, and so on and so forth. Um, I'm going to discuss initial findings from an evaluation that I'm leading that provide insight on program improvements um, and how to implement it in other hospitals based on the lessons that we learned. Um, and overall, just explore ways that we can improve transitions of care for people experiencing homelessness. I think most of us know that people experiencing homelessness have high rates of hospitalization, and that's probably not a new uh, fact. Um, our team looked at health admin data in Ontario from 2018 to 2020 and found that the rate of hospitalization to medical surgical units was almost four times higher for people experiencing homelessness than housed individuals. Um, and psychiatric admissions were 128 times higher than housed individuals. In a study that our team published in 2019, we found that 27% of people experiencing homelessness um, discharge were readmitted within 90 days to general internal medicine or a medicine unit. That's the equivalent, within 90 days. Um, factors that were found to be associated with lower readmission rates for this group were having a case manager or a social worker um, and having at least one informal support. What these data really helped show and reinforce is what most of us know is that there's a really clear breakdown in the transition of care from hospital to the community for this group. People aren't getting the care they need in the community. The community often lacks the resources that's needed in order to provide this care. Um, and people's health issues often worsen um, or new ones emerge. Um, and then they land back in the hospital. A very clear example is wound care, as I'm sure many people know. Um, if someone leaves the hospital and they need daily wound care, um, but those who are providing wound care have a really hard time finding the patient or the client in order to do that for them. Um, they might get an infection, it worsens, they come back to the hospital. So it's, it's a real cycle. To try and intervene and address some of these issues, uh, Dr. Stephen Huang and our team developed the Navigator program. The Navigator program is based on a critical time intervention case management model. Um, CTI is time limited case management that mobilizes supports for individuals specifically during periods of transition. Um, the model helps facilitate continuity of care by ensuring that a person has ties to community and support systems during these really critical periods. Our program is predominantly health focused. We're embedded in the hospital. Um, and we really are aiming to improve post-hospital outcomes for people experiencing homelessness. But of course, we have a very clear understanding that much of what stops people from achieving improved health are other social determinants of health and other barriers to, making, to meeting their needs. Um, so we also do what we can to help address those within what's in our, within our scope. Um, and we really try and help people manage their own health conditions, again, with what might be within their scope to do so. I'm going to go through a few aspects of the program. Um, so these, these are core to the model. These are things that aren't necessarily contextually flexible. So some things that if you were going to implement a program in your own hospital, um, these would be really important considerations to replicate. Um, so one is that we are supporting patients to stay in the hospital for their treatment and make their discharge plan a reality. That is 
most of the work that they do in the hospital. Uh, to make connections and referrals to community-based providers. Um, to support patients with social related matters during post-discharge period. I'll go over what some of those might be, but think around getting identity. If they don't have identification or you know, a license, things like that. Um, getting health insurance, making sure that they're signed up for that. Um, taxes, getting their taxes done so they become administratively ready for housing, things like that. Um, as well as transferring patient-related information, such as health information, to healthcare providers and community-based providers with patient consent. Um, this is a huge issue, information sharing. I think everyone experiences a lot of barriers in accessing the information that you need. The program consists of homeless outreach counselors, um, at least one, depending on the hospital. We have three right now. We've just hired a third. Um, just because we have so many people that we're supporting. Um, they're based in the hospital. So this is a hospital-based program, and I'll explain why that's so important uh, in a bit. Um, and on an inpatient unit. So it's really important that they have an office or a desk space in the hospital on the ward or on the unit. Uh, I'm going to use the term counselor and HOC throughout, and I'm referring to the homeless outreach counselor when I do that. Um, we receive referrals from all hospital units, except for psych psych psychiatry and obstetrics and gynecology. Um, they have specialized programs for people and those who are get, um, admitted to those units that we don't necessarily have, um, and they require specialized support that we're not necessarily well equipped to deliver. So that's why we've made that decision. Um, the homeless outreach counselor really is 50%, half their time in the hospital, half their time in the community, and they move back and forth as they need to to support their clients. So this is very, this is part of what makes the program so unique, um, is they can move back and forth. And that doesn't happen with a lot of other community-based case management who might not have access to the hospital or social workers who work in the hospital but can't really follow clients into the community. So they really do move back and forth. Um, each person has about a 15 to 20 patient caseload. And we, we generally offer 90 days of service, but um, it's incredibly flexible. We are very flexible based on what the client, I use client and patient interchangeably, uh, what the patient needs. Um, some patients we've had for a year, they leave, they come back, they, they use us as a touch point when they might need more services. Um, so it's really flexible, but the idea of the critical time intervention piece is that it's a quick intervention to help people stabilize and then hand off to community-based supports. This is also very important. We have a patient comfort fund. Um, we provide phones to anyone that doesn't have one. We help support with transport to and from medical appointments. So that will be an Uber or a taxi that we either send to pick up the client or if the homeless outreach counselor needs to go and physically pick them up and take them to appointments, they do that. Um, food, books, other things to help with entertainment, also to help them stay in the hospital for their treatment. Sometimes people just get bored and they really don't wanna be there for the next week, so they end up leaving before their treatment's done. So anything we can do to help them stay um, and sometimes it is as simple as boredom. Uh, we use a harm reduction approach, and that's incredibly important for reasons I don't think I need to elaborate to this group. Um, and the, the program really is relationship focused and patient centered. So each, each case plan is tailored and unique. Um, and it's important to note that we don't have formalized, specialized housing access or shelter access. That's not a part of the program model, so that shouldn't be a barrier for thinking about how we can do this program in other spaces. When the program was being developed, um, a number of assumptions were made, and we had to make some assumptions then to, to design the program. So first, we are making the assumption that patients desire and benefit from care coordination and that they require support during their hospital stay. It's our basic assumption. It's the reason why we're doing this. Um, we assume that there's currently poor communication between hospital and community-based services that hospital staff and community service providers see the need for the Navigator program and for care transition support, and they're open to collaborating with the program. And I think we, I think this is really important. I mean, some of, this, some of these are assumptions that we made based on evidence, I should say. We did interviews with stakeholders, and it just come out of thin air. Um, we also assume that quality of care provision within the hospital for you know, everyone, all the hospital workers that are providing care to people experiencing homelessness can improve 
with the Navigator program being hospital-based, thinking around knowledge sharing and that knowledge might pass over from homeless outreach counselors who have specialized knowledge to other people working in the hospital who might learn and back and forth. We have assumed that there is availability of healthcare providers and community-based services to support patients in the community. I'll talk about that a bit later. Um, we assume that people experiencing homelessness often have poor stigmatizing and discriminatory experiences in hospitals, um, and we are hoping that this program can help improve this. We are assuming that building trusting, consistent relationships is key, and I think evidence supports that. Um, we also assume that patients experiencing homelessness need advocates in the hospital and in the community. Anyone who's been in the hospital before and you have family or friends and come and be your advocate and your voice, um, I have, you know how important that is, and so if you don't have that, um, it's very hard to be your own advocate when you're in the hospital. Um, we assume that having the program embedded in the hospital on the unit will help with easy referral um, and meeting patients as soon, as soon as possible upon admission, and I think that's also really key. As soon as patients are admitted to the unit, um, we try and meet them ASAP. And lastly, that uh, the program has to be low cost. It can't, be, it can't cost a lot of money um, in order to make it sustainable. Um, and it, doesn't, it can't really add a lot of extra work onto the already stressed load of hospital workers and staff. So it can't be a program that's asking doctors to do extra or social workers or nurses to do extra. They have so much going on already. So these were some of the assumptions that we, we based the program on. Uh, since 2019, when the program launched, um, the program's provided service for 771 patients. Of these, 517 have needed medium to high service intensity, um, and we're defining that as about five or more service notes or service interactions. Um, in, 20, in October 2021, Dr. Huang launched a randomized control trial, and that's really examining health-related outcomes. Um, specifically, are we able to connect patients to a primary care provider, which is key for helping to prevent readmissions and improve their health. Um, we're looking at hospital readmission rates, we're looking at number of days in hospital and connection to case management in the, in the community, and a longer list of other outcomes. Um, but to accompany the RCT, we have a process evaluation and a qualitative outcomes evaluation that has two distinct objectives. So while the RCT is going to be able to tell us if our intended outcome is achieved, it really can't tell us how or why we're able to achieve it or not. Um, and as researchers, we're always finding ways to examine how things went, what works, what doesn't, how we can improve things. So we really wanted to explore other aspects of the program and factors that may shape patient experiences in the program. Um, I think it's really important to understand that outcomes can also be shaped by implementation. So sometimes a program idea is great, but it wasn't implemented very well, and therefore patient experiences or client experiences aren't very, don't go very well. Um, we want to, yeah, we want to just really understand if those assumptions that I talked about and if the things we think are going to make the change actually are the things that are going to make the change. And we know that context really shapes everything, so I wanted to explore context as well. So the first objective focuses on those three things. Um, and then lastly, the RCT has an intervention arm who gets the program and a control arm who gets usual care. Um, and so I'm, in the process evaluation, we're, we're looking at, um, sorry, the process eval only looks at the program itself. So in that, we can only interview clients who experience the program, but we knew that there was a gap. We really wanted to interview clients and patients who get usual care and be able to compare what those two experiences are like um, and when people are transitioning from hospital to community. So to do this, we conducted interviews with five different uh, groupings of participants, um, the implementation team, the homeless outreach counselors, hospital workers um, across the hospital that we receive referrals from. Um, we spoke to RCT participants, so even numbers from the intervention arm who get the program and the control arm who get usual care, um, and community service providers, really to understand what's their experience now working with the hospital and interfacing and interacting with the Navigator program. How is the program or has the program changed how they're able to support clients um, and how they're able to interact with the hospital and the healthcare system? Uh, we're going to be doing uh, a database review to look at dose. So 
how intense of a program of the program intervention do most clients need. We also did about 130 hours of uh, non-participant observation, which is basically shadowing. We just don't actively participate in the program delivery and a lot of field notes from team meetings and program meetings. So I'm gonna present some initial findings. We're still deep, there's so much data, so we're really deep in the data analysis. Um, but so when we examined the many different aspects of context that could be shaking, shaping the program's implementation and operation, we obviously noted many things that you're all gonna be familiar with and maybe sound redundant. Um, we conducted the evaluation during COVID so the program started before the pandemic, but the evaluation happened during the pandemic, which was actually an important time to do the evaluation because we got to see um, pivots that people were making and if those were working or not. Um, but also, yeah, it was very hard. Um, so we faced immense challenges accessing constrained resources in the community. Alongside uh, a housing crisis, Toronto is really bad. It's really bad everywhere. Um, it was really hard for the homeless outreach counselors to help find appropriate discharge destinations for their patients. And they worked so hard at this. Um, oftentimes quite successfully, I have to say, it just took a really long time. And that's a really long time that a social worker in a hospital or a care transition facilitator might not have that amount of time to devote to only finding a discharge destination for their patient. So that, that's one thing that makes this program a little bit unique. Um, they really relied on relationships that they already had with existing community service providers. It, it was informal relationships. It's, I'll talk about that a little bit later as well, but that's one way and different strategies that they use in order to get people into spaces, sometimes through backdoor access to shelters and things like that, like whatever they could do to get their people into safe spaces. Um, an unintended positive consequence from the pandemic response uh, was the shelter hotels that the city rented to house people. Once those opened, the homeless outreach counselors were able to support some patients, many patients actually getting into these spaces. And they were amazing because people had their own room. Home care was able to come to their room uh, and find them and provide them necessary medical care and so on. Um, Primary care was very hard, so that was a main outcome for the randomized control trial. We wanted to connect people to doctors or nurse practitioners, and that became increasingly challenging as people's uh, patients, yeah, they just had so many patients that they were seeing, and so they, a lot of people, the wait times would be three months, and when you need to connect somebody to a primary care provider within the next two weeks, three weeks of hospital discharge, um, it became really, really hard. So we, we did some work and tried to figure out okay, are there family care teams? Are there health centers that we can kind of informally partner with where we say, we, we're gonna have these number of clients coming to you. Um, maybe we can help get them in the door, even if it's a shorter intake or whatever it is. We tried, they tried everything they could. Um, a really positive thing is that hospital leadership has been incredibly supportive of the program and of the work that we're doing and see it as a really important part of the care that St. Mike's provides. Um, we really hope, little plug here, sorry Stephen, we really hope that this will help with buy-in when we look to transition the program from a research study um, to normal operations to ensure long-term sustainability. So we're hoping that the good work that is happening and the benefit that they're seeing come out of this will help with sustainability. Um, we also have some pretty consistent funding at the moment for the program um, from the foundation and generous donations as well. Um, and that's really helped to ensure for now sustainability of the program. And we're, yeah, like I said, we're, we're working on this some more. When we looked at how the program was implemented, it was clear that some things really worked well and other things needed to be improved or could be improved for the next program. So again, having the program embedded on the hospital unit led to easy referral. So there's no paperwork. There's nothing that needs to happen. A nurse can literally just go find the homeless outreach counselor and say, we have a patient in room X, in bed X. Um, I'm pretty sure that they're experiencing homelessness. Can you go see them? That's it. There's, there's no other, or they'll get a text or an email from somebody on another unit. Like it's very, we try to make this as easy as possible so that it was so easy for the hospital employees uh, to do it and to contact the program. Um, the other thing is that having the, 
the HOCs in the hospital meant that they go to rounds, so they're able to flag any patients that they might maybe have to go see. Um, and it really helps create a team feeling with the hospital workers. And I think sometimes uh, with community case management and healthcare, there can be silos and it's really hard for them to talk to each other and trust each other. Um, so this really helps create a bit more of a team feeling that they're literally a part of the team and embedded on the unit. Um, role clarity. So there was a bit of a challenge clarifying that the HOC role was different from current so social work role uh, or care transition facilitators is what we have. Um, so instead of operating as a complementary program to the work that was already happening, which is what the program's supposed to be, um, sometimes the hospital staff would hand off patients or offload tasks onto the homeless outreach counselors, um, or there would just be a lack of clarity over who was responsible for what. So again, if you're thinking about what could this program look like in our hospital or healthcare center, whatever it might look like, um, I think role clarity is one of the number one things of really, and constant you might have to reinform people and talk about it more and more. What's the program supposed to do? What is this role supposed to do? Hiring, I think it's really important that the homeless outreach counselors have experience in the community. Um, this is really imperative for them to be able to best support patients and provide that specialized care. Um, and then they have connections in the community. That's really important. But they also need to know um, medical conditions and terminology or be fast learning. Um, they said that uh, this was said to make buy-in from the hospital team and onboarding a lot easier when the program was being implemented because they could keep up. In rounds, they could keep up. They understood what the health conditions were and what the patient needs in the community were going to be. This also helped for the community service providers, by the way, because they, didn't, they had someone translating for them sometimes the medical stuff um, and then what, would they need, would, what they would need to do to support that medical stuff, like at the shelter. Um, so it was really helpful on both sides. One thing we did assume, as I mentioned before, was that homeless outreach counselors would be sharing information and knowledge with other hospital workers and thereby improving support all around for people experiencing homelessness. And I think in some ways this has happened, but what we found was that the HOCs, um, they're protective of their resources and of their relationships that they've built in the community. And I understand why they, they are doing that, um, especially during COVID when things were really scarce. Um, they didn't necessarily want to say, oh, here's my contact number for the manager of this shelter where I can get patients in through the back door without going through central intake. Um, because if I give you that number, one, I don't know what that relationship's going to look like. And I've now put myself behind this. And two, um, I don't know if I'll be able to use that contact or resource anymore because if, if everybody else is using it, I might not have access to that. So there's, there's some challenges we need to figure out, too, with how do we share resources um, and make it more of a, a program in that way. Just a quick quote from one of the implementation team. Um, they said, and then when COVID hit, um, he was doing all these things with the shelter hotels and was able to help us that we didn't really have access to. So I remember thinking at the time that we all need to have equal access. The ability to pick up the phone, call a contact should be the same. I think the argument the homeless outreach counselor had at the time was, yeah, but I'm the one that's also making these connections, so you're not going to have the same opportunity as me. So I remember during implementation, there was a little bit of that conversation as to the fairness of how to get people where they need to go if we didn't have equal shelter access. And I don't have a good answer for how we solve that. Um, mechanisms of change. So I think what's really important is that the HOCs really act as a bridge between the hospital and community service providers. That's beneficial to all, like all stakeholders, the client, the patient, uh, the hospital, and community service providers. Um, they're improving communication between hospital and community. Uh, so community service providers now have a contact, and some people even refer to them as a colleague in the hospital, someone that is their touch point. They don't have to call a unit, try and figure out who was taking care of the patient who's already been discharged, and figure out, have any questions they might, they might have. They don't have to go through all that and through op, you know, the operator at the hospital. They just call the homeless outreach counselor or text them with client consent, of course, um, and just ask questions of them. So they have somebody in the hospital who's a point person, and that's huge. Um, the HOCs also know medical terminology, and as I said before, they, they act as kind of a go-between between, between the hospital and the community service providers. Um, there's an improved connection between patients and community service providers that the community service providers also talked about. So there's warm handoffs. Um, the HOCs don't just do a paper referral and then kind of pull back. 
they really oftentimes will go meet the case managers with the client. Um, they might even stay in touch with the client or the patient after they've moved into community case management just to check in and see how things are going. So there's a lot of relationship building and more handoffs, which is great. Um, there's increased acceptance from community service providers to, ex yeah, to accept patients and clients if they're connected to our program, and we heard that a lot. Um, this meant that sometimes shelters, if, if one of the HOCs would call the shelter and say, you know, we have a client, they might have some more medical complexity than a shelter would normally be comfortable with or able to support, but because they were coming with this more intensive case management and knowing that this HOC was going to be there, was going to help bring them to appointments and whatnot, the shelter would be much more willing to take them in because they knew that they there was somebody else that they didn't have to provide that support that they didn't have resources for. Somebody else was going to do it. So they trusted that. And we also found that primary care providers, so doctors and nurse practitioners, um, they would be, so I don't know if you guys have had clients that have missed appointments and then sometimes doctors aren't as willing to reschedule. Everyone's nodding. Um, doctors were more willing to reschedule. Again, because the HOC would call, I'm so sorry, the client missed the appointment, we mixed up the days, or something happened. Um, so it's, it's been a lot easier to get them back in to see the same care provider. I want to note that we are struggling with losing some patients to follow up. Um, sometimes that can't be helped. Some clients leave hospital, and some people don't want interaction with the program, and that's totally fine. That's up to them, right? It's about what they need and what they want. Um, but I think it's important, and one of the homeless outreach counselors, so this didn't come up in a lot of the interviews, but one of them talked about the fact that we are, we are really not doing a great job of support, su excuse me, supporting young black men, both in the hospital and in the program. Um, we're losing them to follow up in the community. We're still working on really understanding the problem of that. I think all of us can sort of pick up on, um, I mean, just anecdotally, there were stories of like really bad experiences in the shelter system and facing stigma and racism. Um, and then, so how do we support these patients in more intensive ways? Um, yeah, I wanted to know that. It's, it hasn't come up in a lot of the interviews, but it was really important. Uh, this quote really helps highlight the benefits that the community service providers discuss when working with the Navigator program. I'm recognizing the time, so I'm going to try and... Okay, yeah, great. I'm going to try and speed up a bit. Um, so if we're following up with mutual patients, it's easier for us to connect with them. The HOC to find to test results or discharge papers. If we know we're following someone who's been admitted, we can connect with them instead of having to go through the hospital switchboard. And they're able to sometimes give us a heads up on where the, they are, the patient is. Um, they'll give us a heads up and say, hey, patient so-and-so is in the hospital again. She's here for whatever it is. They can give us a straight on uh, just what is going on, how long will they be, be there, and so on and so forth. And another participant mentioned that, yes, there's been a good amount of trust, relationship building, collaboration if needed. If they have a client that our shelter case manager is supporting, then he's the one that directly connects with the HOC, or when they're on site, they will kind of do a check-in. St. Mike's isn't within our catchment, so this is kind of important. St. Mike's isn't within our catchment, or we're not always connecting with the hospital, but we are trying to do what we can to support those patients, especially who have been long-term waiting for beds. So again, when people come with supports, it's easier to make space. Couple of outcomes, um, patients, we, so we talked to patients who received the program and who didn't. Patients who received the program report feeling really well supported, um, that they have someone that they can connect to, um, some discussed feeling like they had an advocate and someone who was consistent in their lives. Uh, people talked about that they had that person who didn't give up on them, even if they weren't at their best behavior all the time. And I think that's really key as well. The training that the homeless outreach counselors have, they stick with people, I mean, within, you know, their own safety and stuff as well, but they stick by people's sides. So if there's a behavioral incident, they aren't discharging patients from the program. That's not what we do. Um, a few clients, patients, said that they really wanted housing and they didn't really necessarily need any of the other supports that the program offers. Um, and then others that we interviewed weren't totally clear on the different things that the program and HOCs could offer to support them. So that's something we need to improve on is really sharing information very clearly about what the options are that we can do. Um, sometimes you ask somebody, what do you need? And you don't know what you need. So sometimes having a list of the things that you could need is helpful. Um, the goal of the program is to do warm handoffs to community services. 
to be that bridge. So getting people into housing isn't often realistic for us, especially with a 90 day kind of critical time intervention time period. It's a bit out of scope of what the program was even designed to do. Um, but it does happen sometimes and sometimes we are able to do it. And we definitely help get people administratively ready for housing so we can get those applications in. Patients who received usual care and didn't get our program tell me that they they actually generally have had pretty good experiences at St. Mike's, um, but many did say that their discharges happened too quickly. What hit me the hardest in the one interview that I did and some other interviews was that when people describe their loneliness um, who, who weren't getting the program. Some patients are generally quite independent, um, and so community workers who, are, who haven't prioritized them because they're triaging the clients that they have, right? They're working with people who maybe need the most support. So um, you have some of these more independent patients and clients who maybe aren't getting the attention that they need. Um, but it, some mentioned that they, they actually had no social supports, not even anyone to talk to. Um, they're very isolated. So I think this is a group that's also kind of getting missed in some of these programs just with the lack of resources and when people are trying to meet the needs of, of people. Um, and I think what's really important about the program is that sometimes um, even if they're working with someone who doesn't need a lot of support, the patient and the client, is, they're still connected. So there's still someone to contact um, at any point in time that they can go to. I think that's really important. Last quote, uh, in terms of the, so this is a patient who got the program. In terms of the program for getting me my meds, yes, that's one that is, that is very helpful, I must say, because at the time I didn't have the means to get it and whatnot, and access to doctors also, that was really helpful. Even having you guys, to speak to you guys in terms of my medical condition, or even the way to manage it and whatnot, has been a great help. How much time do I have left? Oh gosh, okay. Okay, this one's a long one, so I might have to keep, anyways, there's many issues to current transitions of care from hospitals to the community. Um, we need to build better bridges. I mean, everyone knows that. Um, okay, a few takeaways from the program, specialized role. Uh, so hospitals with a larger patient population of people experiencing homelessness, like ours, we have a lot of people. Um, they need a specialized position to support these patients. I don't think it's fair to rely on existing positions alone to accumulate all this knowledge. I think they really need a specialized position. Um, it works best if the hospital staff member can move between hospital and community. Again, that's really important because you can go somewhere and physically locate the person. That's really key for follow-up. Um, and then if you're hiring more than one person, it's really important to think about how some patients feel most comfortable with case management, with case managers who understand their experiences. Hiring indigenous case managers, hiring case managers who come from different racial and ethnic backgrounds, it's so important for representation, for people feeling like this person can understand my experience, I can trust them a bit more. Uh, other groups have talked about formal partnerships, and we really rely on a lot of informal partnerships that the Homeless Outreach Counselors have, but I think it's really important that we formalize some of these, wrapping up. Phones, we give all our patients phones if they don't have one. Sometimes they keep them, sometimes they don't. Oftentimes they keep them. We can, you know, at the, we pay for their phone plan. It's not very expensive with a Rogers uh, care plan. I mean, again, this is in Ontario, so I don't know what the situation is here. Um, but that's really key, because you can call someone, text them, or they'll text you. That's important. Point person, having someone in the hospital who's a point person for communication for both patients and community service providers. Sorry, I'm speaking so fast now. Um, advocate, discharge processes, as you all know, really need to be tailored to patients' realities. You can't discharge someone with diabetes meds if they have nowhere to store them. You can't discharge people in a wheelchair to a shelter that has no elevator. Um, oftentimes, hospital workers, they just do not know what the spaces look like at a shelter. They've never been, they have no time, there's no education about that. Um, so we really need advocates who understand the spaces better. Resource sharing, I talked about that. I don't have an answer, it's a problem. Uh, we need to figure out how to share information and um, knowledge between the homeless outreach counselors and the rest of the hospital staff. I think it's happening, and the more that trust is built, and the more you're part of a team, that happens more and more. Being embedded in the hospital, I could talk about that forever. That is absolutely essential. Um, oftentimes clients are discharged, a referral is put in, then they're discharged, and then community case management has to go find them three weeks later, figure out where they might be in the community. It just doesn't work very well. Increase knowledge of one another's sectors. Um, develop very specific processes from discharging from hospital to shelters and to community services. 
uh, like hospital processes and policies in place. Have conversations with those stakeholders. That really needs to happen. We're in the process of figuring that out right now. Our program also works because we're low cost. We pay salaries for the homeless outreach counselors and we have the patient comfort fund. That's, that's what our costs are. So low cost is really important. And no extra work. Um, you can't ask doctors to be doing extra work. It's not going to happen. You can't be asking nurses to do extra work. It's, it's too much for what they're going through right now. So it really can't be uh, extra work and add on. Ah, thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you, Vanessa and Jesse, very much. Uh, we were supposed to have about 30 minutes for... Uh, for possible questions. We've got 15 minutes, which is still quite good. So if, if there's anyone with some questions, please. Uh, yes. So I'm going to get the, we got the microphone there. Oh, I'm pretty sure I'm loud enough. I think it's for the recording, <laughs> oh, okay. is my understanding. OK. Sorry about that. <laughs> So my first question to Jesse is, I wish we had that program here. But I do want to say, I run a shelter here, and I partnered with the QE2. So in our shelter, we have three beds for the men and two beds for the women. Now, they're short-term, and we hopefully we can transition them. But, and sometimes we fill the beds because, you know, it just happens. Yeah. But I do sympathize with the social workers at the QE2 because they say they're the emergency room looks like a homeless shelter. And this program would be amazing. And, you know, even though we do have a, a nice program with North End Clinic, it's called MOSH. Like, they help quite a bit. I can't say enough about them. Um, with, you know, extra services with health care and stuff like that. But I, I'm calling the social workers tomorrow and telling them about your program. <laughs> I'm just telling you. So I'm going to pass on your information. Absolutely. And the second, so the question is for you. Um, so our problem is, is that we're a dry shelter. And um, we do work with them to transition into housing and stuff like that. But the problem we're having is, is because they feel safe now and they have, you know, social activities, like, you know, social interaction and stuff. Like we got big TV screens that they sit and they all watch. Football season's really bad. Um, but... Um, they don't want to leave. Mm -hmm. Like some of the women are, like I'm having a hard time transitioning this woman into a senior complex because she, she makes every excuse possible mm -hmm. not to leave. And the other thing is the men that have left, now they want to come back. Mm -hmm. And it's like, yeah, that, that can't happen. I get a list like of 75 people. And it's hard to do that. Like it's hard to, like I don't, I, like, <laughs> I'm struggling with that part. Like, you know, you got your own place. Like, they do have a safe place and a, their own place, but they still want to come back. Mm -hmm. So I'm struggling with that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. But, yeah, I do wish we could. <laughs> do you want to respond? Um, yeah, Please. sure. I'll, I'll respond. Uh, I think that's... I think that's um, that's a problem that I also had with Myrna. <laughs> so when she was in her transitional apartment, she didn't want to leave for you know, autonomous living. And it's, once again, it's, I think it's that gradual exposure that this approach has, right? It's not just, I didn't just walk in the park with her once. You know, I went several times and told her like, look, this is, you can have this. We can take this meaningful activity and um, give it to you in maybe in a different way, but when you live alone. Right, so developing, so finding the meaning in what, not just that activity itself, but what was meaningful about that activity, and then trying to find a way to replicate that where they are so that they feel comfortable and uh, feel like they have the supports exactly yeah. once like they're, are, once they're told her, they've left. Yeah, like, yeah. You can yeah. visit every day if that's the case. And we are letting her do it gradually, like, but she, she just comes up with yeah. an yeah. <laughs> every day, Every week, there's another, yeah. like, another yeah. situation. And it's like, it's like, we're letting you go gradually, yeah. and you can come see us every day if you want. Yeah, right? exactly, exactly. So, I mean, I don't mind her coming because she loves to clean. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, I think it's, once again, that, that capacity building component yeah. of it. Not just offering the activity, not just saying we're going to do an activity and give you bingo yeah. and give you whatever, but saying, okay, well, how, what skills do you have to, ha to make that activity happen for you, yeah. right? Um, yeah. But it is, it is a... Everything's scary when it's new, right? So, yeah. That's, that's the way. 
Yeah. Okay, we got a question here and then I'll go over there. Um, thank you both for your presentations. Um, my question's for Jesse. At the beginning of your presentation, you mentioned the goal is to keep folks in hospital so that then their discharge plan can become a reality. Is that like through your your fund to keep them there because they're bored and like avoid self-discharge? Or is that through advocacy through your health, um, homeless outreach, the workers, to, because your healthcare system is trying to dis miss them sooner than they should be because I'm from Edmonton and I'm noticing like folks should be in there for care and they're getting discharged a lot sooner than they're actually receiving like adequate care. Right. Okay. Is this on? Maybe. Um, that's okay. I, it, I think I'm talking loud enough. Um, so there's a combo. So sometimes it is advocating like if our care team is pretty good that if the homeless outreach counselor says, um, actually, I really think this now I'm double mic'd. Uh, I really think that this person needs to stay longer for X reasons. Um, they'll generally listen if, if it's, you know, we keep people for extra days and extra nights if there's nowhere to discharge them to. Nobody feels good about discharging somebody um, to the streets or even to a shelter doesn't feel great. In Toronto, there's, the shelter system's full. That's part of our content. There's nowhere to send people. Um, so we work really hard. They work together to do that. But oftentimes it is about how do we keep the client in the hospital so they can get the treatment that they need because they'll leave, um, they'll self-discharge or leave against medical advice, however you want to term it. Um, sometimes they're bored, sometimes they're scared, sometimes they're not allowed to go smoke cigarettes and come back. So we work with the team, like the homeless outreach counselors, they're amazing. They will, they'll, they've made relationships with the doctors. So they'll just go talk to the doc or the nurse and just like, explain it and they're like, I'll come take the person down and bring them back up um, for whatever they need to do, right? For some people, it's they need to go use. And so it's about making sure that um, we can make that happen for them um, and advocate for them. And honestly, the hospital team, I know a lot of, I've heard so many stories that it's really hard working with the healthcare system, but having this person on the hospital, the doctors and nurses and everybody ends up trusting them a lot more. And so it makes it a lot easier to, to advocate for those things. Hi. Uh, first of all, I'm obsessed with both of you. Your presentations have me so like Stop. just excited. Um, I have a question for Jesse specifically. I um, I was last year I was a social worker on internal medicine in a hospital. Now I'm a community social worker working in homelessness. So your program has really fired me up a little bit. And my question, I guess, is you were talking about like the confusion of roles with social work versus the homeless outreach specialist or whatever the role is called. Um, I feel like I can see exactly what was happening there. I've been on both sides of it. Um, what is there, do you have any examples of what you guys did? Like, was there like a, okay, the social worker has to be on the case if the homelessness outreach coordinator is on the case? Or do you have any examples of how you kind of differentiated complementary versus social work? Yeah, I think that's still a work in progress. Um, a lot of it is just about how do you introduce a program to the healthcare workers? How do you explain the program um, and how frequently do you do it? People are really busy. So a lot of people are just like, oh, I recognize Jane on the floor, and I know Jane's the person I go to if there's somebody who's experiencing homelessness because um, Jane knows what they're doing. But I think what, what started happening was just that Jane then became the only person supporting that person, right, that, that patient. So, and they've had to, I've just from interviews with them, they both had to like, negotiate those situations. So I think it really is a management in the hospital um, role to go in and really talk about role clarity, um, just so that nobody's overwhelmed and that everyone's working together. And I, I don't think it's intentional. It's mostly just like, you know how to do this better than I do, or you have the connections. Um, so it's a, it's a back and forth and constant negotiation. Thank you both for uh, your presentation. Vanessa, I wrote down, we have to work more with uh, 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 yes. So we're gonna talk, we're from Montreal, both of us. So we're, we're gonna talk. Here, yeah. So my, my question is for Jesse, actually. <laughs> um, I manage a team of, uh, actually we do prevention of homelessness, but for incarcerated uh, men. So Great. it's pretty much like CTI, but from a detention facility. And our main obstacle is, well, discharge is legal. So we cannot keep them inside 
um, for a, lo a longer period of time because of like it's detention centers. Mm -hmm. My question is like I know like 90 days of service is really really short. On our side, we we work with them up to a year, and I know that most of the relationship building is before discharge, is before release. So my question is more about how many interactions or many meetings are the HOC having with patients before discharge to build to build this trusting relationship so like so the trans transition can go like smoothly so like what is the magic number of interactions well, yeah. like what I know I know I yeah. know yeah um, I, I would like to know what the magic number is um, I, so the way it works is they try and meet the patient as soon as they're admitted mm -hmm. as soon as possible I mean if a patient is out of it and not medically well you don't force yourself to convert like where you come back but that's the goal, so that you establish a touch point. Um, they give the business card, this is who I am. I'm gonna come check in on you later. Can I get you a coffee? Can I do this? So it really is just about showing up. It's about face to face. Start asking, they start asking, um, what, you know, where do you hang out in the community? What parks do you like to go to? Or what um, different centers do you frequent? Things like that. Um, I don't know how many interactions they tend to have. And sometimes someone's hospital stay for inpatient can be two days. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's a week. Okay. So if the patient's there for longer amounts of time, they have a lot more time to be going and back and forth and checking in on them. If it's really short, that's why you try and connect with them as soon as possible. Here's your phone. Already that builds, like, yeah. people are like, oh, you're giving me a phone. So like, we can stay in touch. Like, that's, cr that's amazing. And you have a plan. Like, it's covered. Don't worry about it. Um, coffee, different things like that. So I'm not sure that it's, it's necessary. That first one is really important. If the patient leaves and you haven't made that first connection, it's very hard next to impossible to find them again in the community. Um, I don't know, not to put you on the spot, Stephen, but was there anything you wanted to add just based on your experience? No, okay. Um, yeah, so I would, I would say at least one, but a few of these informal, that's not about let's talk about your case plan but it's just really informal. What can I get you? Do you need any food? Those kinds of things, I think that goes a long way. Thank you. Yeah. I think there was a question, a couple of questions at the front, and then I haven't even looked over on this side. Is anybody asking questions over here? You had a question at the back, but you, go ahead. Is it on? Okay. I think you So I'll make it short, I think we're, we're short of time. Um, so really want to comment what both of you are doing. It's really amazing. And I really love your example of Myrna. And I think the final, you know, the Myrna was throwing up her hands and being really happy. I think, I think in, in a way, that's what we want people that we support to feel at the end of, well, not at the end of the journey, a new beginning of the journey, let's say. So really wonderful. Um, I, qu I have a question for Jesse, actually. So um, the question is, you mentioned one of the, the solutions, I guess, of what you would like to see is more knowledge about sectors. And uh, I'm intrigued by that. I think it's something that's kind of the holy grail I've been seeking. I used to work in nonprofit health sector, supporting advocacy for people with diabetes. And um, now I work in housing, more at the policy level. So I'm not at the front line, per se. But I'm just interested in knowing, in terms of the pursuit of increasing sex knowledge or bring more people along so they can exchange from the, from both front line but more at the policy level, whether you, like what experience you have, that success experiences that can be replicated, um, good messages for us to carry on. <laughs> yeah, so. I mean, something that's, it might happen in your communities too, in Toronto, um, it's not consistent and it's not necessarily a policy, but a lot of hospitals will do walkthroughs of shelters so they'll do a visit, um, and the shelter staff will take them through. So this is what the physical layout of the shelter is. This is what it looks like. This is what we're able to provide. I think just talking to people for my PhD research, that was huge, because they had no idea. Mm -hmm. I think at a higher level, we're, uh, myself and a, a number of other people on our amazing team are involved now in conversations with staff at the city who run the Shelter Support Housing Administration. Um, there's a bunch of different conversations happening, but it really is about how can we develop our discharge process? Um, how can, and, and the last session we were in, people are just, they're talking to each other and they really didn't know, like here's our, like shelter staff are frustrated with healthcare workers. Mm -hmm. They get patients showing up at the door in a taxi at midnight or whatever. Mm -hmm. So they get to voice that frustration to the hospital. 
right? We're, here, we're in the same room, we're listening. We hear your frustration, we're working on this on our side, and vice versa. If we're frustrated that you won't accept patients, we have nowhere else to send them, we can't keep them here. Um, so I think really it is literally face-to-face -face sitting around the table, it's not anything crazy new. Developing clear uh, policies and processes for, okay, what is this, how do we make this work that meets both of our needs and, and serves the patient, um, the client. And I think that's that's really key. So having lots of those conversations, and we're doing those more at kind of like the, the city manager at SSHA, like that kind of level as well to make that work. And well, then the emergency department is a whole other ball game. Okay. There's no, there's no like discharge. So we've got, um, can we take the last three quick questions, okay? So the woman right in front of you has a question. I'll be quick. Um, thank you both for your incredible work and presentations. Um, I have some technical questions for Jesse, so I'm just going to throw them at you. Yeah. Um, so my first question was about the RCT. Um, how do you decide who doesn't receive the program? Like, is it just by chance, or is there like a specific criteria that you have? Um, Can I answer that super quick? Yeah. So um, we. We screen people for eligibility. They just have to be experiencing homelessness, and then we use a randomization algorithm. It's a computer program, mm -hmm. and it, it's completely random. So that's what decides who gets the intervention or who's usual who care. Who doesn't? Okay. Um, and then my second question was around um, inclusion of youth. So I think your program is specifically for adult populations. Um, are youth excluded? Stephen, do you remember what, what is the age at which? We'll take anyone Right. Well, sometimes people have, have people as young as 16, mm -hmm. but we would never have anyone younger than in our hospital. So okay. not younger than 16. So youth above the age of 16 are included. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then I was wondering from the qualitative component of your study if you've seen any, in, any indication of patients or clients' experiences or relationship with the health system improving as a result of being involved in your program. We are... It, that's really hard because um, people know their case manager and they don't necessarily have uh, thoughts on the hospital per se. Um, and it's really tricky coming from the hospital. You have to do a lot of work to say, like, this doesn't impact your access to services, but whether or not they're really going to tell you if they like the hospital now when you work for the hospital um, is very tricky. I have had a lot of people say, like, I was treated really well and this was my favorite experience. They compare it. They compare it to other hospitals, and they say they like the experience that they had with us. So I, I'll just leave that there. But yeah. okay, okay, thanks. And that's, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, there's a gentleman over there, and then there was this gentleman. Yeah. Thanks for taking my question. Really quick, HOCs are they a nine to five, or are they working into the evenings? Outside supports are typically a, a nine to five. Hospital twenty four seven. How do you yeah. bridge that gap? They generally work eight to four, and then we're also looking at uh, if we can have funding for relief, so uh, workers who can kind of fill in some of those gaps. So yeah, weekends um, and nighttime as well, but we don't have that right now. Thanks, uh, Jesse, just a, a quick question, or we could take it offline too. Uh, on the issue of uh, sharing information, particularly with community agencies, I, I know St. Mike's is involved in a sharing agreement with a non-HIC or non-health provider. Is that something to leverage in this program as well? I'm quite familiar with the nav navigation program. I think we participated in it too. Um. <laughs> uh, but to leverage that, because that's a a big sticking point with uh, non-health related organizations that they can't have a conversation uh, with the hospital or a discharge or what have you, uh, an honest one, uh, to assist in that navigation of the health system with, with a client or a patient. Yeah, so right now we don't have, Steve, I don't think we have data sharing agreements with most, yeah. like not, not specific to this program, the hospital does, as you said. Um, every client uses a different service, Some, sometimes there's overlap, but they'll use a different service. So to create a data sharing agreement with each service that different clients might be using, the legal work and the paperwork and the demand, I mean, it would take a really long time. Um, we do what can happen, so because the HOCs build trust with the client as well, um, they often do get patient consent to share information with whoever they might be working with in the community, shelter workers, case managers, et cetera. Um, 
and, and they're able, they have access, the HOCs have access to medical records, they have access to connect care, on care. they have access to all that stuff. So if they get consent, they're able to share that information. Um, but we don't have data sharing agreements at the moment, and I don't know if that's on the horizon, but it's something that maybe we'll take back and discuss. Yeah, that thank sounds you. good. Well, I, I want to thank you all very much for hanging in, and can we just uh, have a round of applause for these two wonderful presentations. Thank you so much. Great. Have a good evening, everybody.